This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. It's got another great guest as usual. This guest is going to help you fill your park with newer, better homes. He can work with you as the park owner, or he can work with your residents directly. He's based out of California, does a lot of work out there. This company is called Franco's Mobile Homes, and please let me welcome my guest, Franco Perez. Franco, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, good to, good to see you again, and uh, I know you a little bit, but for the audience that doesn't, maybe tell us your background. I know you've you got a kind of a following online as well, and um, really big at upgrading communities, so give us a little more about how you got in the space and what you guys do for a living. Yeah, I, I guess wow, how I got into the space is an interesting story. But uh, you know, I came from a immigrant family, and uh, what do you call it? I was renting for a while. I, I had this weird family situation where my parents split, and I had to support my younger sister and my mom. And uh, it was the hardest time of my life. And I ended up getting into real estate, and I remember the time. Uh, I remember the times where I was just trying to get out of that rat race. I was putting money together just to pay rent every single month. And I didn't understand why it was so difficult. I felt like we were good people and we didn't have any opportunities for ownership. Um, Ended up doing well in real estate. I ended up disliking it because I really wanted to focus on helping people that were in my shoes when I was going through that pain And, and come to find out Mobile homes was a perfect place for that and um, got addicted to working with mobile homes. We're actually working directly with residents. I I feel people don't really understand how valuable these mobile home parks are and how much help it is for the middle class to be able to get a step ahead. Um, So we really built a business that's focused on benefiting a lot of these working class families like teachers, nurses in different areas to get opportunities for ownership. Um, So we went there, started working with clients, helping them buy mobile homes. And then we got into replacing their old mobile homes with new ones. And that's really been our focus is beautifying both the parks and also beautifying these residents' personal homes as well. Replacing these old single wides with 1,500 square foot, three bedroom, two bath, beautiful mobile homes. And we really push the limits of how beautiful we can make them too. So, um, but yeah, it's what I love doing now. Right. So you, so sometimes you work directly with the resident, right? You just, you'll go to the residents or educate them that, Hey, you can go, you can buy a bigger, better house. We can help you do it. We can deliver it. We can source it, all that stuff. Right. Exactly that. Yeah. And a lot of times what you'll find is what they'll spend is is actually less than the amount that they'll gain in value, in their future value of selling their home too, which is the beautiful thing. And what do you do with the the older homes? Do you guys demolish them or do you send them to sell them? Do you do they move them somewhere else? How does that work out? It is a case-by-case case scenario. Some of these very older ones, like in the 60s, we have to demolish them. Um, if we can find someone that will take them, then we'll donate it to them that way. But usually there's not a lot of value that we can pull from the old unit. And, and the value itself is really in the location and the spot that it's in as well. So right. the old home, there's really not a lot we can do it, but with it. But anytime that we can, we'll just give it to a farmer or that sort of thing so they can make value of it. Got it. I'm interested to hear how rent control is impacting that and the pros and cons of that in your business in California, because I toured a, several parks with a, a large owner in California. And what they were doing is they would help people get a new home. But part of their motivation was in this particular municipality, if you pulled the home out, rent control kind of died with it on that particular lot. They'd bring a new home in and they were just giving these homes away to some transporter to take them across the border into Mexico and repurpose these older homes. But then they'd have lot rent was 400. They bring a new home in at 800, but then the resident was happy because they'd lock in that 800 plus, you know, de minimis 
cola increases and then they'd have a nicer newer home better for the resident but nicer more stable home at a higher lot rent for the park owner so is is that how some of yours work or are you, are you in some of the communities where if they can they can replace the home and keep the same lot rent that was there on the older home Every municipality is different. So like in San Jose, they have a rent control for anyone that is going to be replacing their old one to a new one. The rent actually stays the same. Uh, however, in outside areas like Concord and that sort of thing, the it's a bit different. Like if they upgrade, they have the parks themselves have the right to raise the rent to market and that sort of thing. And then if it's like a park uh, doing when we work with parks to replace their old ones with new ones, then that rent control is uh is no longer like you said it's it's no longer part of that space itself because it's either a dealership or, or the park taking over the space then they have the right to raise the rent uh as much as they can to put a, a newer home in there as well and it gives them both values through getting more cash flow and a nicer home in the park which essentially makes their park more valuable as well too sure so in in general are the park owners receptive to this of, of you guys coming in or hostile or don't even know or don't even care or, or some combination? Well, I think, uh, you know, it depends who we're working with. So so every every park owner, um, we work directly with the residents themselves. And then we also work with park owners that, uh, that want to beautify their parks. They'll usually have like seven to 15 homes that need to be replaced. So in many cases, we'll help handle the eviction side if they have issues of that. And how do we turn these homes into a win-win for both cases, for the residents and then also a win for the park? Because they're going to have the opportunity to put a new home in there. And then on the other hand, there's another service we do, which is we help host educational um, educational events for their residents. How do we allow for the residents to be able to replace their old homes and help them understand the benefits of replacing their old home for a new one on the resident's dollar? And it benefits them because they have a better sense, a, a better lifestyle of living. Their home value goes up by a, by a lot as well. And it's, a, it's also a win for the park as well, because you have tenants that are more invested in their property, they're taking care of their homes. uh, And then also, the overall vibe of the park is way nicer, because you have a better ratio of new homes in there, too. Got it. Do you have many challenges with fitting the new home on the older lots? And I feel like a lot of older parks, that's a challenge um, with setback laws. And depending on grandfathered rights, you do or do not have And just just practically even I've seen parks where even if the zoning is favorable and you could bring in a home of any size you want. If the lot's only 48 feet long, you can only got 48 feet long. Yeah. Is that, is that a problem you have to, you have to navigate as well? It is. It's a problem all the time, but we've, we've created systems around it. You know, we have different builders that can do customizations of different sizes. Um, we always consistently make different modification to these homes as well. Um, for example, we have these carport steps that actually go into the home to cause to allow more space on the carport side, which allows us to essentially create more square footage per home. In many of these ca- these cases are in metro areas where square footage is a very important thing. So we always try to maximize the square foot of the interior of the home so that the value of the home ends up being as high as possible. Um, with that being said, Each builder has its own different customizational limits. And with that, we know how to build the most value for the lowest amount of cost and make it a win-win for all, uh, for both parties. So, but it's, it's all trial and error. We have clients that want very high end homes. Like we've built a few homes in Agora or Malibu area where they want really high end homes. And if you've seen our, YouTube stuff, you can see 12 foot high ceilings and really pushing those limits of of how beautiful these homes could be too. Um, And then you have the very affordable homes. How can we get just an affordable home? We want, we're on that edge of remodeling our old home, but we really don't want to because we're stuck with all the old piping, a lot of issues that can come up later, bad roofs and that sort of thing. How do we, how do we help them make that leap to instead going into a newer home? And with those, it's usually the more affordable ones, which 
the higher level of standards really make a difference. And you have a new home with a warranty, you can really feel more comfortable, better insulation, save on energy costs, and you'll be able to finance those as well direct to the consumer. And the consumer has a higher resale value when they sell it later. And then also uh, the park doesn't have to be involved during that. I don't know what what kind of price do these high. I'm curious the high end homes in Malibu. What kind of price do those bring? Because I'm here in the Midwest, and you know, <laughs> you know, I saw mobile homes for thirty thousand, uh, sometimes fifty or sixty. But my guess is you're well over a hundred. <laughs> uh, well, so with this, it's always contextual to your area. It's just like real estate. Uh, you know, you can see three hundred thousand dollar homes in real estate, and you also see two million dollar homes, right? So, but in San Jose area, for perspective. Um, renting an apartment is about three thousand a month. Owning a single-family home, median price is one point seven million dollars. So the new homes are typically, on average, about four hundred thousand uh, dollars. That's in a park with about a thousand dollars space rent. That's San Jose, which is in Northern California. Now, if we're talking Malibu, Agora Hills, these very high-end areas, we we built a home and and that one went for one point two million dollars. Oh, wow. uh, that's in a <laughs> park, which is kind of insane, right? Um, wow. So, and then we also go to other outside areas as well. You know, there's homes and parks that we sell for 140. That's probably the lowest new homes that we work with. But you know, we're expanding to outside areas as well and working on dropping those prices too. So, but it's all in context to your location. You know, if you live in an area where people are willing to pay more on rent, if you live in an area where it's very difficult to own single family homes, these are markets where these mobile home parks, uh, the, the nature of it is really, they're used to these high price points and they're used to it because they know that the, the alternative people don't actually want to, pay, there's a lot of people that don't want to pay this rent forever. And they, they, if they understand the model that if I can use that same amount I'm paying monthly instead towards a mobile home, that's brand new, that's actually mine, that I have my own privacy, my own carport with parking, then I'm going to go that route because at the end of five years of making those payments, I actually own an asset that I can resell later versus if I rented for five years, guess what? You're already in the red. You don't have any value you can get back that you can sell later, right? <clears throat> sure. yeah. And part of that value, I believe, is created because of the, the rent control in place. Is mm -hmm. that correct? It is. Yes. Yeah. So, that's been one of the, I mean, as a park owner, I'm, I'm not a big fan of rent control, but I mean, that's part of the, it's like the, the theory of rent control is it's supposed to keep rent affordable, but it's, it's basically in some respects, taking the valuation of the real property and it's shifting it to the homeowner at the expense of the landowner. And, and maybe that's equitable in some sense, but it, it feels like it's taking some of the free market out of it. But I also know that you know, we need affordable housing everywhere. And, you know, the quote affordable in San Jose is different, you know, it than, it than it is in other places. Like you can't find 250 space rent, right? So it, it, there needs to be some way to still provide housing for folks, you know. And there's always two sides to things. And, and you know, every area has its own different reasons of why they have it or why they don't. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, in, in different parks, you'll find uh, there are pros and cons to it. I have a lot of friends that do uh, mobile homes, park ownerships too, but, you know, that's why there's still these big entities that are buying mobile home parks that are in rent control areas, because there's other ways of value that they can create that return as well. Right. So whether it's through appreciation uh, and that sort of thing, but, uh, but yeah, I think one thing I wanted to discuss too is, is a lot of these myths around these mobile home parks and, and why it's um, why it's often misunderstood. Because one thing that I love that you're doing is you're helping people understand how these mobile home parks work. But I think the media really portrays these parks as, very ugly places but if you actually go into a lot of these parks you'll come to find out that man some of these parks are like resorts they're like retirement communities and you know you have every, you have private swimming pools beautiful greenery and it's really a quite nice lifestyle and i think that's where we really have to work together whether it's the residents themselves or the park owners themselves as well is how do we 
really broadcast our product to be to be seen as a great place to live and a great asset as well because we're often fighting some of these uh, entities that are trying to close down these parks uh, but in in the reality we're all on the same side here trying to protect the keeping these parks and, and making it uh, more understood as well so yes, do you certainly. ever face these bad myths on your end excuse me do you ever face uh like bad myths about like or bad stigmas about mobile homes oh sure yeah i had a call this morning with the guy that he's like yeah i want to build 200 200 sites and i got room for 400 if we do singles and and let's go talk to city let's get this done i'm like well it's going to be a little harder than that because the city is generally going to say that mobile home parks are not good for the tax base not good for the school system not good for police fire hospital etc so the stigma is real and i mean i've had mayors of cities tell me point blank i'll say one city in particular where i've done some investments i used to do some retail there as well they had a lot of retail storefronts and you know big power centers and things like that and i said you guys need affordable housing because those are those are relatively low paying jobs and People can't afford to buy in, in our market, you know, a four hundred thousand dollar house is a big market, a big house. So like so like people can't people can't afford four hundred thousand dollar houses. They need hundred and fifty thousand dollar houses, but there really aren't any. So the mobile home and the mobile home parks can provide that affordable housing. And the mayor said they can live somewhere else and commute in to serve our food at our restaurants, to work at Home Depot, to work at a grocery store, et cetera. He did not want affordable housing. He goes, I don't want he goes, I don't want those people. Uh -huh. in my school district with my kids it was like wow he was, yeah. he was he was just point blank like heck no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do this so yeah we we face a stigma all the time and yeah. we do a lot of zoning work all over the place and you you find out real quick when you look at the code if they're welcoming or if they're not and then sometimes the code is vague or um even absent in some but then you find out real quickly if they're like we're not gonna let you do it um and or if they hit you with code violations just because you exist, even though there's, you know, an apartment or a neighborhood next door that has the same violations. Right. So mm -hmm. the stigma is real for sure. Um, I think it's getting a little better. It depends on where you're at. I mean, the, the communities you describe with, you know, pools and amenities and greenery, like, yeah, I think people see those as like, you know, almost like senior housing. Yeah. Excuse me, like, like downsizing. You're like, Oh, I'm going to move into a loft downtown. <laughs> to be near community and nightlife. And they're like, oh, I'm going to move into a mobile home park, you know, because I want to just, you know, live more with my friends and play shuffleboard and play bingo and, you know, you know, karaoke night and stuff. I don't need the big house. I don't need the big yard. You know, I don't need the basement, things like that. So sometimes you can see that um, we do most of our work in the Midwest and it's, and there are just are less of those truly retirement communities. So um, we, we, we mostly work with people who are, you know, working class and live in this housing product because they choose it over apartments, not because they choose it as a downsizing from a McMansion or a, you know, big suburban home. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't, we, we generally don't do the customization of homes or see that as much. We, uh -huh. we have some options of customization at the factory, but it's just like, yeah, I'd like to add a jacuzzi tub to that. Or yeah, I'd like to make it the three bedroom or the two bedroom, or I'd like to add, you know, different features on the outside, or we, we add features that are not part of the home, but, you know, park amenities, or we'll put a bigger deck on it, or we'll put a patio on it or things like that, as opposed to completely redesign the home. We, part of our norm is um, cost effectiveness. So the customers typically want the best bang for their buck. And that generally means less bucks. It doesn't mean, you know, painted in gold it means it's brand new it's nice still a hud home is so it's it's definitely better than they're going to get in single family or multifamily for the same price per square foot so oh, totally. our 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 sales pitch is you know look how nice this is and how big it is for only 50 cents on the dollar exactly 75 cents on the dollar. oh totally and and to what you said it's like that's unfortunately um, the thing that we're facing is these stigmas really is around people that have not been into these communities. They haven't seen them. They don't really have much empathy for it because all they see is through Hollywood of like, whether it's Breaking Bad or like uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's how they imagine these parks to be. And that's why they're so against having these in their cities and, and, and um, you know, that's really our goal with our YouTube channel is to show 
how beautiful these parks are. We also love sharing stories of how we help these residents have that affordable housing element and how they're how we're able to successfully help people get out of that rent rat race and be able to start owning something. And, you know, to me, that's why we've been asked to speak at a lot of events is how do we market to millennials, these new wave of millennial buyers and help them understand that this is a, this is a great option. This is a, a very valuable option for them to think of as an alternative to these rental apartments, because most people just think it's either I'm either going to rent or I'm going to buy a single family home. And they don't see that there's an option in between that might be actually way better than both in many cases, you know, and, and, and we're often overlooked, unfortunately, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's really our goal to gather people like you and, and people in our community to help build an organization that's um, that makes our industry looks look good and and seen for what it is and the value that it brings to our economy and, and, and that sort of thing too. Yeah, no, I think it's good to, you know, try to continue to reach the younger generation. Cause yeah, it is a stigma. I've told several friends of mine and even people that work here, like, Hey, if you want to bang for your buck, you should go rent a mobile home you know, buy a mobile home ideally. But if, you know, some, some people don't want to buy because they don't make commitment, but like, they're like, oh, my girlfriend won't let me do this or my, I don't want to do that. I'm like, you're burning a lot of money at those fancy apartments. And yeah. some of them are even that fancy. It's just, it's just burning a lot of money. I, I, when I was younger, I didn't, I never, I never lived in an apartment. I, you know, lived in college housing when I was in school. And then I bought a house, five houses down from my college. And then I bought it, fixed it up, had some buddies live with me moved, bought another one, repeat, bought another one, repeat. So I kind of bounced around kind of blue collar single family houses as part of, you know, living plus investment strategy. So I never really got into the apartment game as, as a renter, but then I saw a lot of other people like, you've been renting for 15 years. Like, do you realize how much money you've spent renting? They're like, yeah, but I get to move to a new cool place every two years. Uh -huh. And it's like, yeah, but yeah, you're paying that for somebody else. Right. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that that is one of the beauties of the mobile home parks or manufactured housing communities is you can pitch people on and provide, you know, the American dream of home ownership, right? It's like, exactly. this was not, this was, this is, and in particular, you can get into some of the mobile homes with lower credit and or lower down. So it's like, this really wasn't a realistic dream in their mind. They're like, yeah, I can never do that. Who can save up that kind of money? So with some of the financing programs out there now, you can get in for, you know, thousand two thousand five thousand dollars and get access to um the path to home ownership obviously you still have a lot rent so it's not a hundred percent but it's not a hundred percent and in a lot of anywhere because you got property taxes right so it's exactly. like you got to pay something obviously a lot rent is more than in my neighborhood we have hoa dues so you know you, you got to put you, you know if you pay your house off you still got to pay the government and you still got to pay the hoa or they're going to oh. take your house so you still have some monthly obligations um, or annual obligations um, but yeah, I think it's total cost of occupancy is a key variable. And then the value you get for that total cost of occupancy, the freedom, the flexibility, the autonomy, et cetera, it's all part of the choice of housing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, you know, it's important we have these low income opportunity. I mean, affordable housing for low, low income people too. You know, we, we need those stepping stones for people to be able to get ahead. And, and I think, I think people need to, whether it's a park owner or whether it's uh, us as well, we have to be able to express and educate the world of how valuable these are. And, and you, you, I'm sure you already see it, but I feel like mobile home parks haven't gotten a lot of attention or change in the last 10 years or so. But if you look at the last year, these are starting to become a hot topic uh, for a lot of these, whether it's uh, REITs or these funds that are just, taking up these parks and if they're seeing value we should see it as as businesses as well right oh yeah i mean obviously in the last since covid in particular the, the values have gone up and the, the demand has gone up for the communities you know i think because people realize there there's always demand for this type of housing product it's just yeah if, if we can change some of the stigma and get some of the nimbyism to go away and some of the city regulation to go away, it becomes more viable that these communities can remain. Um, yeah, so. exactly. So, um, but yeah, 
and uh that nim that that whole element of that you know it's it's just they have a m- misunderstanding and you know i feel like the most important thing is to share the stories of these these individuals that are having um success through through ownership because we build value in all three different elements right have you had much luck with municipalities kind of coming around when they see that you're bringing in nicer homes and providing and preserving more affordable housing? Are they being receptive to you or do you even get involved with the municipalities since you're not owning the land? Is it really not your issue as much as it is the park owners? They are way more receptive. And I think that's why we really challenge ourselves in one in a lot of these homes of how beautiful we get them to look, whether it's a waterfall quartz countertops, um, you know, all full steel, uh, stainless steel appliances, very modern cabinetry. That is really what brings in the attention. And I'm able to get these, you know, these these people into the door and like, hey, I need you to witness this and see that this is an affordable option, right? You know, how do we get this in, a, in an area? How do we get this to look beautiful and still be a success element for their residents? These municipalities have their uh, needs of having affordable housing. So how do we make them the hero by being able to help us have these parks protected and have these parks um, have these parks w- more understood of how they bring value to the, the municipality itself, right? So we often have um, uh, we all we often have them come visit these communities I give them tours of these communities and even like these mayors of these cities have never driven through it and mm-hmm. and I'm just shocked I'm like you've always had this stigma about it but you've never taken a chance to drive through it you know they're like I'm busy this and that but you know once they drive through it they're always shocked they're like wow this is a mobile home park like you know I can see my kids living here you know and that sort of thing uh, but of course it's different to every area it's different to every park um, but once they actually go into these parks, you'll find that they start to understand why these are important. And you start to talk to these residents, you start to listen to these residents' stories. Then they start to realize how valuable this is and how how we could really make a difference and in, in impact uh, for a lot of these very important working class people to have a home in a metro area or in an expensive area that were originally not able to chase that American dream of home ownership. There's a lot of people that feel like that dream of home ownership is completely dead. Whereas like if you're renting and consistently renting like your friend for 15 years, it's very tough to save up a down payment and eventually think you're going to buy a single family home. But if you can go a little bit more than what you're spending now and own a mobile home, live in a mobile home that's pretty nice in a nice community, just that shift of shifting your payment from renting to a mobile home, that gives you an extra added benefits in taxes and equity in in the uh, loan pay down that you're doing. And five, 10 years later, you actually have something that you can sell and use as a down payment to then purchase single family homes, right? But if they didn't make that step in between, they probably could have never owned a single family home. No, it's a good point that, you know, it's kind of some people to transitional housing. We bring a lot of people in as renters because they're like, I don't know if I want to make the commitment. I don't know if I want to buy. So say, okay, we'll give you a lease and then we'll come back in six months and see if you want to buy and we'll lower your payment and all that. You'll build equity. And a lot of them will say, eh, give me six more months. And they come back like, do you guys like the neighborhood? Yeah, I've been living here a year. Do you like your neighbors? Yeah, I've been living here a year. You like the house? Well, yeah, of course I like the house. It's a great house. You like the price? Well, of course I like the price. Uh-huh. Okay, you like school district? Yeah. Do you like building zero equity, paying more in rent, having no ability to paint the home, and having being subject to rent increase on the whole 100% of your housing cost next year? Like, uh, no. Here's an idea. Stop renting. Start buying. And then you know convert them, and we and we we do both rentals and sales. But a lot of times for financing, like Fannie Mae, for example, will want me to get thirty five percent or less park owned homes. So I bring people in sometimes as renters. Then I got to convert them, and I got to watch that number. You know, like okay, I got to get them. I got to move six more. I got to move five more. I got to move four more. And if I'm bringing more homes in, I might say, okay, I can only rent 
one out of three or one out of two because I got to watch that ratio. It depends on the park. If I buy a park that has no park owned homes, I can rent more. If I can buy a park that has uh, a lot of park owned homes, I really have to push the next tranche, sale, sale, sale. And we put price them with that in mind, price them to move as opposed to trying to price them for a profit just to get the occupancy in the column I need it in. But that's yeah. great that you guys can convert people, you know, that are, that are either A, renters or B, their other outlook is I get to rent an apartment or I get to rent a space and own the home on top. Exactly. Because the truth is, is that they're not really taught a lot of these pros and cons and actually how cash flow works. You know, unfortunately, they're so focused on their career. And, and if they're not um, a lot of the wealthy, like understand how assets work, where are my cash flow is going, where, you know, is it going towards an asset and that sort of thing. But a lot of these teachers or, or, or middle-class people that unfortunately they're not taught a lot of these values and why it should be different. And that's really our focus of our channels to educate people like, Hey, why would you spend 3000 a month on rent continuously when you can spend 3000 a month, 1000 on space rent? Yes. But 2000 of that is going towards an asset that you own and just making that shift of payment and your home might actually be bigger and better. Just making that shift, you're, you're actually going to end up with a higher success rate and higher options later down the line, right? So that's what I love about mobile homes. That's why I love it so much. It's so misunderstood. And, and the people that are able to really see the value of it are the ones that are going to reap the benefits, right? And, and that's kind of the key thing here is they are misunderstood. And, and how do we help people um, know more about this so that they can, they can have an option to be able to grow? Good stuff, Franco. Any <laughs> other any other tips or tricks before we jump? Um, I think no, uh, nothing that I can think of. I, I think it's a um, it's really just connecting a lot of people. I, I feel like I love what you're doing with this show because you're connecting a lot of high value people in this industry that are making this industry better. So um, I think that's something that I I appreciate about your show. Yeah, great. Man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Where can people find you after this? Um, all of our links are on www.franco.tv. And it showcases like our new homes that we're building. You'll see the home in in um, SoCal, like, like we, what we were talking about. And we see a lot of educational videos of how these homes are built and how it's helping the middle class and how it helps park owners and stuff as well. All right, man. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks, well, God bless. Thanks for having me. You got You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review, and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.